Anil, and thanks everyone for being here. I think this conference has been really exciting for me so far. There have been a lot of talks about AI, about the future that it holds, and it's all very exciting. About Pari talked about how India can be relevant in the entire future that we envision around digital technologies. While I agree to all of this, but the topic that I'm going to talk about is the struggles that large companies have when it comes to scaling AI initiatives. And a lot of that is from the learning that we have had at Drop, which is the AI-based decision-making platform we are building for the last one and a half years. And approximately 200 plus conversations that we have had with digital globe decision makers who have successfully scaled AI products and teams. So when I got this topic back uh, in January, I sat with my team and trying to figure out what is the one trigger point in history when machines started becoming intelligent. And I think we tied it all to the Bayes theorem in 1763 when Thomas Bayes uh, questioned or introduced the concept of predicting events using mathematics. And then in 1950s, Alan Turing questioned, posed a question to everyone, can the machines think? And ever since, all the movies, all the books, all the fiction has been fascinated by this concept. There have been legendary characters like the Terminator, the R2-D2, the Jarvis, just questioning or building a hypothesis that what if the machines are smarter and what can they do? Well, no machine has so far been able to pass the Turing test, but the progress that we have made in AI has been very rapid. A very good example of it is Google's inbox, the smart reply feature. This was a feature which was proposed by Google as a joke back in April 2009. And just five years post that, they actually built this feature, released it to the public, and right now, over the last, last two years, there are more than 10% users who are already using it. And it's not just one example or one random event that happened that makes us believe in AI. If I look at, back at my day, since morning I have been reliant on AI. I, I woke up thanks to a recommendation from Google that I need to start early because of the heavy traffic. Then I checked the route to plan my travel. I booked a cab using Uber, which again uses AI to optimize its algorithm and get the best cab. I'll potentially take notes on Evernote and convert them to searchable indexes using Evernote's hand recognition platform or hand recognition software. And end of the day, I'll most likely take a selfie with the Zenov team to conclude this. Right. So you might be wondering in this video why I'm playing a Mario video. Is it to crack a bad 90s kids joke or to make you nostalgic? But this is not Mario. This is a program called as Mar.io, which is a neural network self-learning platform or self-learning software which was introduced to the Mario world. When the program first went on or accessed the Mario game, it didn't know anything. It didn't even know that when you click right, the character moves to the right. But after 100 iterations is what you see as a result in the video. The, the, the key takeaway is that the AI systems or the intelligent systems are trying to now compete, or at least be at par with humans. Right? And it's not just games, it's not just fun examples. There, are, there have been very recently certain examples, particularly in face recognition, lip reading, or detecting diseases using the machine learning and vision algorithms, which are better than doctors, better than humans. And this progress is not just in one example, two examples, or four examples that I've talked about. It's omnipresent. It's present in every industry. If you look at BFSI, there are companies like Betterment, Wealthfront, companies that I personally really like, who are changing the way consumers had access to automated uh, trading platforms. They're making decisions for them, recommend the best trading strategies. In healthcare, there's a lot of focus, a lot of work happening around automating, or at least augmenting the works that doctors do in diagnosis. It's happening in enterprise software, where people are using software, or machine learning algorithms in supply chains, even replacing certain jobs. RPA has been a great success. There is a very recently Airbnb released a developer version of an API, which leverages the designs that the designers create and self-creates HTML files out of it. This could potentially impact a lot of front-end jobs that we have in India and worldwide. It's happening in automotive industry, it's happening in retail industry, where Every minute, minute decision, be it product placement, be it pricing, is done through AI. And in a way, we drive, we transact, we buy, we work, and we're almost living in the age of AI. And it's not just that consumerism drives AI, or AI is driving consumerism. Yesterday, we had CEO of Niramai here, who talked about her work in the AI space. I think the sound is not playing, but they have been making a large social impact, largely using AI algorithms Women to predict breast today, cancer. That is breast cancer. Breast cancer is killing more than 500,000 women every year. At Niramai, we have developed a new method of doing breast cancer screening based on a technology that we've invented called Thermalytics. It is 
using artificial intelligence algorithms on thermal images. We use a very simple device such as this one to capture the heat distribution on the chest of the lady and our software which is based on machine learning and uh, AI uh, actually are able to detect abnormal tissues on the chest. Well, there are a lot of success stories and these are all exciting examples with very wide and huge impact. Not everybody has been able to succeed or lead this AI race. And again, we got back to our drawing board with my team and tried to find an answer to this, to do this landscape, to try to understand who's actually leading the AI race, who has been successful and why so. And we clearly see three kind of companies, three kind of organizations. One is the tech mafias, the five companies with the largest market cap in the world, who have huge cash reserves, who have huge profit pools. They have successfully built so, built so many AI applications. They're acquiring companies and truly leading the AI race. And, they are the start and then there are the startups, the hyper nimble, the hyper agile companies who are iterating every day. They're making a release almost every two days, out competing, out maneuvering the larger companies. And then there's the rest of the world, the companies who have made certain bets, who have tried to create a play for themselves, but have failed in many times, have succeeded few times. And the reasons why they have failed are many vast and wide. The, for example, there are regulatory issues in certain cases. One example is this company, Admiral, which tried to change the credit underwriting using AI algorithms and Facebook data, but really was a regulatory constraint. Then in certain industry, data orchestration is an issue. Data standardization is an issue before you can even bring your AI algorithms. And in certain cases, the companies are just trying to do many things. For example, this company, Unanimous AI, they were trying to predict the winners of the county derby, which is actually a random event where gambling, luck, etc., is involved. But there is something fundamental which is different in the companies who are successfully building AI organizations or AI products versus the companies who are not able to scale. And how we define that is the DNA of the organization is different. By wh what we say as DNA, there are five important elements which are different in the AI leading organizations. One is the customer expectations or the customer experience that is delivered is very, very different. It's more personalized, more reactive, sorry, more proactive rather than being reactive. The enablers, which is the product development processes, the ecosystem is very, very different or the connects with the ecosystem is very different. And most importantly, the talent war in the AI space is very, very different. It's more scarce. The way you engage talent, the kind of talent you get is very different from how you have traditionally hired engineers. But to lead all of this, Every AI-first company or AI-leading company leads a different kind of leadership, more visionary, more risk-takers uh, than the traditional space. Talking about each of them, I think this is slide is very, very obvious, this point, that customer expectations are very different. All of us are used to the experience that is delivered by Google, delivered by Facebook or Instagram, et cetera. Very hyper-personalized, very responsive, and in certain cases, the same consistency is maintained across multiple devices, multiple form factors. And it's a, now these form factors are multiplying every day. There are iPads, there are iPods. In certain cases, there are only messages or voice-based systems that are coming. So the UI, though, is changing drastically, but the experience that people expect is the same. And that brings me to the second point, that since your products are changing, do the product development or the product development process needs to change? And this is a very interesting finding that we had. We spoke to approximately 100. Uh, AI machine learning teams, AI product managers, and AI sales teams, and found a conundrum between these three teams. Even at drop, we face this. So the machine learning engineers are always complaining that they don't have enough data. They can only scale system to X percent accuracy, which is roughly 80, 85% based on existing data that they have in their labs. And the sales teams or the product managers are always complaining that this is not enough to go to market, right? We cannot build subscaled or sub-accurate systems and make them public. But the answer lies somewhere in between, and which a lot of big companies have successfully been able to do. Release product as and when they're re ready and change your cycle. Instead of uh, build, release, uh, you know, test it a lot, and then scale, you have to release it as fast as you can. Gather feedback and then improve your systems. This is what Tesla has done over years. Right? They released the feature of autonomous or semi-autonomous driving, which is definitely not 100% accurate. There have been accidents. There have been a lot of news about it. But what they have been able to do is gather tons of data. Tesla already has 100 million miles of data, which puts it well ahead of the competition. While that's a very successful case study, another case study was Microsoft's bot, Twitter bot called Tay. They released it back in 2017 with the objective of learning how humans make conversations. And the 
board when it started was really nice, very engaging, but after a day of, lear a day of learning, it became very racist and very nazist, and almost offended any everyone. But the point is, even though your systems may not be 100% accurate, your product may still not be at that stage, it's better to iterate early, release the product, and get feedback. And in line with that, we have released something at the Zenov Confluence. It's called Sigmoid. It's our conversation bot for the Confluence. It helps you keep engaged through the bot, uh, through cracking jokes. It helps you about, know about the schedule. And it also opens up one element of uh, machine learning that we are doing at Drop. It's combining machine learning with psychology. It helps you understand your psychographic personality and what are your likes, dislikes. So I would recommend all of you to go to this URL or scan this QR code or go to our booth and try it out. The intent of releasing this early, it's not 100% accurate, obviously. It's just 80% accurate, most likely. But the intent is to gather this feedback, understand how leaders like you make conversations. And the interesting thing about the platform or the bot is we built it on a hackathon. During three days, a team of three developers who are actually at the drop booth, they build this out, grounds up. And that is, I think, the fundamentally different thing when we look at product development in AI. It's not about building everything grounds up. It's more about orchestration of platforms, combining APIs, training it on your models. For example, if you look at Sigmoid itself, which is, I, I, I'll iterate again, the drop bot, it's built using IBM Watson's API, which is readily available. It uses, uses web speech API for voice to text conversion, uses dialogue flow for NLP interpretation. And all of this coming together within three, four days, and it functions well to be open in the confluence. And it's not just products which are built in hackathons or products by small companies like Drop. Even large companies are building products in this way. So during our research, we spoke to Medtronic, and they have this app called as Sugar IQ, which is in partnership with IBM Watson using largely the cognitive capabilities that IBM Watson has and the data that Medtronic had to potentially serve 100,000 users. And the question that comes along with it is who's creating this ecosystem and why? Right? There are so many APIs that I talked about and all the machine learning engineers use. And when we analyze that ecosystem of who is driving these APIs, it's again the tech mafias. Uh, the most popular or the most prevalent API in the mach machine learning space, which all ML engineers would have used at some point is TensorFlow. Right? And then there are the APIs from Microsoft, the frameworks from uh, Facebook, Microsoft Facebook coming together, creating Gloon, which is another project. And why are they doing this? Is it to get the data? Is it to get, you know, make ex increase accessibility? But when we looked at it deeply, we understood the key reason for is the talent. There is literally a war for talent in AI space, largely because it's a multidisciplinary skill set, which is tough to get. But who really owns it is the question, right? And we, again, deep dive into that particular challenge. And a lot of companies talked about it. We are not able to hire AI engineers. We are not able to hire ML engineers. What is a data scientist? Where do you get data scientists? And we said this problem is huge. We analyzed the number of job openings that are there in the AI space. It's currently 100K. And there are only 60,000 engineers worldwide who can be called data scientists or AI engineers. And when we ran a forecast on it, it's going to be scale up to 2.1 million demand of AI engineers or data scientists, largely because AI is going to be prevalent across industries. It's going to get commoditized. And the gap between the demand and supply is going to scale up to 1 million. I think that's a very pessimistic view, e even right now, right? We look at the distribution using some of the work that we do at Drop, and we see most of it is largely concentrated in US. Almost 50% of it is on the West Coast. And 35% of it is owned by tech mafias. And out of the remaining, 20% of it cannot speak English. These are the Chinese or the Japanese developers. So really, there's a lot of scarcity of talent, and it's going to get worse. And there has been so, many, so much talk today about AI, India playing a central role in AI going ahead, and India being relevant. We try to take those assumptions and see what it looks like in the future. And this is the talent simulation that we ran on how AI talent will distribute itself. As you see, there are a lot of pockets of AI talent which are emerging. And somewhere in between them, some, somewhere in the center of that will be India, very, very relevant. Largely because of the diverse ecosystem it has, which Pari talked about in his keynote, and I, I just picked a slide from that, is the combination of R&D centers, the combination of startups, the combination of universities and services companies that comes together. Because AI systems by themselves need a lot of collaboration, and India already has a mature ecosystem. And taking those inputs into our models, we predict that right now, 
there are 7,000 engineers with AI capabilities in India, and that's going to scale massively to 45K. There are certain external fa factors that come into play, one of them being that the democratization of AI knowledge is happening very fast. The MOOCs, uh, the popular online courses, the open frameworks are allowing everyone to l easily learn that and scale AI knowledge. Right? But for all of that to happen, uh, and India to be a force, and India to be a future, I think there's one very critical component that defines large organizations' success in AI. And that has largely been their leadership in the AI space. And again, we took a very, very objective view of this. Uh, a, a lot of work at Drop is focused on combining psychology and machine learning. And we said, let's look at five companies, which is Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and tech mafias, and understand how the leaders differ in those companies with respect to their psychographic traits versus the older companies. And clearly, the leaders in the AI-first companies are more challenge-driven, more visionary, and more imaginative. What does that mean? These are just psychological traits. What it means is three things for a leader to be successful in AI space. And it's not the, the future leaders, it's the present leaders, because AI is happening right now. One, we realize they experiment and iterate more. They make a lot of smaller bets. They, they empower their teams, empower product managers to really come up with new features, which some of which could be 100% accurate, some of which may not be, but they're making those experiments. Second is, they're a lot more dependent on creating and nurturing that ecosystem. The innovation in AI space is not happening inside the R&D labs. It's happening outside. It's happening in the universities. It's happening in the Googles, Microsoft, and you have to combine rather than really compete with everyone. And thirdly, these AI leaders make a lot of bets, and most of these bets are data-driven. And that is what we have ourselves been working on, this third point, enabling uh, leaders in product space, in sales space, in talent space, make those decisions using data and AI. And that is what DROP is. DROP is a decision sciences platform which empowers leaders with intelligence and transactable insights about their customers, talent, ecosystem, and peers. This is something we have been working on for 18 months, team of 20 developers, five machine learning engineers, logging it out every day just to build this platform. Some of the really interesting use cases, which I'll showcase, which we have been able to solve for the strategy teams using DROP, one of the key components always comes is what are the other companies doing? Right? And we ran a, have a simulation on the Drop platform where you asked it the question, what are the major investment themes at Ford? And using human curation and AI, it's able to predict what is the current scale of innovation of each initiative and what it could potentially be in 2020, 2019. Right? Another question, kind of questions we are working on Drop is helping the sales team understand where are the buying centers or where are the buyers located for within an organization. Right, and we asked Drop Platform another question. What are the technology buying centers for General Motors? It looked at the jobs, it looked at leadership, it looked at the buying behavior and predicted this map on how, what are the key locations, which is Warren and Pontiac, uh, where the buying for technology services is happening in, uh, in General Motors. So these are the kind of work, this is the kind of work that we are doing in Drop, largely empowering the decision makers, be it across sales, talent, or strategy teams to make those decisions using AI and data. We are, we are here today. My ML team is sitting outside at the booth. We would love uh, if you guys come and talk to us. We really want you guys to try out a bot, which is Sigmoid, and have a good conference. Thank you.